And now, live from the Imperial Rooms Mayfair, Bossman and Quantic King Size! <laughs> Hello, I'm David Quantic. And I'm Jane Busman. Welcome to Busman and Quantic Kingside. But first, let's meet the team. Hello, I'm Pete Serafinowicz and I've got lovely black hair. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Emma Clark. I like gin and swearing. <laughs> Hi, my name is Steve Brody. I'm on the run from my six kids. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of feedback from listeners this week. <laughs> Thanks. And now, Celebrity Roundup. The following people are no longer celebrities. Mr Motivator, Sir Ranulph Rafe Fines, and TV funny man, Jeff Banks. <laughs> Following new celebrities were announced today. Sarah Cox, Martin Amis, the woman in that advert, and the Backstreet Boys. Brilliant. <laughs> Other new celebrities include the McGann brothers, Paul McGann, Mark McGann, and Renault McGann. <laughs> Twelve new Spice Girls have been announced. They will be deployed from Cyprus to assist the Parachute Regiment on the Rhine from Monday. <laughs> And finally, it was the end of an era today as David Frost, the last 60s celebrity still in service, was decommissioned. Hold him down! <laughs> in this, the year of our Lord, 1492, I bless this ship and wish her brave, selfless crew safe on their historic journey. Yeah, Carol, it's me. I'm on the ship. I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> Dave. What? Think of a number. OK. Can I have a pen? <laughs> oh, no! Morning, Your Worship. Morning. What do you two want? Touch me for a shilling. No. Touch him, Your Worship. Touch him there. Miss? What? <laughs> Stroke us for a penny. Stroke us both for a penny. Oh, get out! <laughs> Rub us for a farthing. Out! <laughs> From the writer and star of Spender, starring the man who climbed the hit parade with the records Country Boy and the Nail File, comes a new series from the creator, writer, producer and singer of Crocodile Shoes, Jimmy Nail! <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Sing us a song, Jim. I didn't know about that, not eh? I'm just a man. A man like you. And me. Oh, where, Jimmy? All right. I am an ordinary Geordie. No side or front or back. Oh, that was cracking, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, where? Here comes your board. Oh, eh, Noddy? Oh, where, Jimmy's board? Oh, hey, Jimmy, you're a good-looking fella. Oh, hey, bird, I'm not. I'm plain, plain like my way of speaking. Ugly like the truth. Hideous! No, Jimmy, you're a god of looks. Oh, hey, and let's have sex. I didn't know about that, bird. I'm just a man. A man like you and me. No! There's a lot of money missing and there's people dead because of me. <laughs> Jimmy! Jimmy! Who oh, hey, Jimmy. It's Prince Charles-like. Oh, hey, oh, Prince Charles. What can I do for ye? It's like this, Jimmy, you know. I didn't want to be king no more. And me ma'am says you can be king. Oh, man! I didn't know about that! No oh, way, Jimmy man. What are ye talking about? You're the man, like. I'm not the man. I'm just a man. A man like you and me. Away, oh, Jimmy. It's Warlord Jesus Christ. Away, oh, Jimmy, my son. How would you like to be God? I didn't know about that, oh, Lord Jesus Christ. 
I'm just a man. Just a country singing, board shagging, mystery solving, orphanage benefit concert doing man. Like you and me. Oh, way, Jimmy lad. Sing us a song then. All right. Raise your hands. Jump for joy. Let's hear it for the country boy. Jane, do you think I've put on weight? Dave, you're a human ball of lard. <laughs> Your obesity is almost noble in its enormitude. Tent manufacturers clothe your breasts and your sweat makes new oceans. <laughs> Daily. No, really, have I? <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I think there's something wrong with Mr. Popplestone. I'm not surprised, you silly woman. I said cut his flowers and put them in water, not smash his testicles with a hammer and feed them to this goose. <laughs> the French have a secret. Ah, bon. Santé. Santé. High up in the French Alps, there's a mountain spring. A pure natural source of refreshment the French have known about for 700 years. Cochon! Twat! Birier. Lager from a French mountain spring. Also available, Urian. Whittle from a mountain stream. Coming soon, Simeon. That's enough. <laughs> Are you a man? Then you need a man's magazine for a man, but not like all the others. Out this Monday. The wrong one. For the man who likes it where he shouldn't. <laughs> the wrong gun. Yours to collect and keep. Issue one includes whoops, sorry, love. Tips on how to roll a maiden over. With a supplement, the wrong and poor fam. For the girl who <laughs> didn't know she had it in her. Free with issue two. In the ear. It's not the same. I'm half German. I know this because as a child, every Sunday I was taken to visit an old German couple who gave us presents. Either I'm half German or my father was an extortionist trading in bars of diabetic chocolate with the corners nibbled off and rewrapped. And discontinued Fisher Price toys like Jeremy the overexcited monkey. <laughs> We're going to visit your grandparents. Oh, I go. You've got to. Your grandmother's looking forward to seeing you. Yes, she's thinking, excellent. What can I make uncomfortably dirty this week? We ring the doorbell. She's in the kitchen, buttering her spectacles. Ding dong. Hello! <laughs> you open the door and a hail of misshapen animals make a break for it. Dachshunds with one ear. Tortoise with the head of a cat, blundering up the path. Save us! Save us! Chihuahuas, which as everyone knows is not a real dog. It's a gerbil with golf balls sewn into its face. <laughs> Old German women don't have coffee mornings. They sit around stitching together new pets from animal body parts. <laughs> My grandparents' house. Carpeted with 200 weight of little round things that you hope are mothballs. <laughs> Not chihuahua gifts. <laughs> My grandparents' house was furnished during a brief experimental phase when all electrical goods were made of teak and powered by ropes stuck straight in the socket. <laughs> Every week, my grandmother liked to watch Swap Shop. Every week, the house burnt to the ground. <laughs> we sit down to the family meal, clearly prepared by a gerbil with golf balls sewn into its face. <laughs> Hors d'oeuvre, the refugee camp of food. <laughs> and finally, you get presents, bought in a shop that only old people know about that sells shapeless flowery dresses. Eastern European toffee and flavours like rose petal. <laughs> and turnip. <laughs> Jigsaws of the Pope with his feet missing. <laughs> the pieces are all there, it's just the Pope with no feet. <laughs> and it's time to go home. Luckily, they never come to see us because, as everyone with relatives knows, drive 200 miles to go and see them. But in the opposite direction, it's too far to travel. <laughs> Thank you.
Theirs was a love that could not be. They could not touch, must not kiss, and dared hardly steal a glance across a crowded room. Instead, they corresponded daily. Pens were their kisses and ink was their embrace, for they were respected figures in their own communities, wise, popular, even loved. Yet, one day, something happened that their wisdom could not predict and their respectability could not prevent. Overnight, these two lonely people became rabbis in love. <laughs> Thursday. This morning when I woke up, I thought of your beard. Your thick, well-combed, luxuriant beard. How I would like to be the comb that wanders happily up and down your chin. Untangling beard hair and removing bits of dinner that have got in there. I thought of your lips. Your wise lips set in a sea of beard that after a meal that I wish I had cooked, you would wipe with a simple linen napkin. How I wish I was that napkin, but I am not. I am at home with only a photograph of you to remind me of our love. Do you remember where we were when it was taken? It was at the rabbi's convention in New York last year when we all had our picture taken together. I have cut off the heads of all the other rabbis, especially fat Rabbi Mendel who had his arm round you, the bearded bastard. So it is just you, smiling, a twinkle in your eye, surrounded by 15 headless rabbis and the Statue of Liberty. I hope this finds you as it leaves me. Yours, etc., Rabbi Esterhaas. Catalogue of the Extinct, Volume 2. Rare birds. This week, Nesmith's farting grouse. <laughs> I can't see it anywhere. Give it time. <laughs> My dear friend, I received your letter and it left me breathless with unrequited passion. How I long to crush your sweet lips to mine, but I know it can never be. I think Rabbi Hymet suspects something. Last night he read to me an old Polish story about two barbers in the town of Lotz who opened a salon together and were hounded out of town by the angry villagers. I forget the point of the story is Rabbi Hymet was eating at the same time as he told the story and Consequently, I was more interested in brushing bits of bread off my clothing than listening to the old boar ramble on about gay barbers for half an hour. <laughs> I must close now, as I have to go and comb my beard. <laughs> right soon, yours, etc., Rabbi Templeman. <laughs> oh. Jane? What? What's that? It's the new All Saints album. Oh, hey, do you remember the Bay City Rollers, eh? Shangalang, blimey, how long ago was that, eh? Ho, ho, here, darts, eh? Here, shawaddy waddy, do you remember shawaddy waddy? Of course I do, I'm 28. <laughs> Is there anything on telly? Telly? Dunno. Here, Jane, do you remember the clangers, eh? Do, 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 all that, all that, eh? Suit Dragon, how that was a long time ago. Here, nog in the nog, here, over the engine, here, Pogo's Wood. Is there any Budweiser in the fridge? Budweiser? Budweiser. Lager. Beer. A double diamond works wonders, works wonders, works wonders. <laughs> a double diamond works wonders. Here, they don't have that now. Here, Guinness, remember that? Yes, you can still get Guinness. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think our subterfuge has the wily Trojan fooled? Are we undetected? Thanks to our wooden gift, we shall remain safe hidden until nightfall. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Carol, it's me. I'm in the horse. <laughs> yeah, it's looking a bit iffy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes being the age that they are. When you're six, you want to be a grown-up so you can be a train driver. Wow. 
All over the country, six-year-olds are going, when I grow up, I want to earn a pittance to sit in the front of an enormous speeding bomb owned by a dodgy private company who <laughs> sold the brakes on this train to buy prostitutes. <laughs> six-year-olds are not to be trusted. For us adults, doctors and nurses are sinister, incompetent figures who say they will cure us, but instead stand round our beds going, and how is our incontinence today, Mr Quantic, at the top of their voices? <laughs> For six-year-olds, doctors and nurses live in a fantasy world of bizarre random nudity and giggling. <laughs> Teenagers want to be adults. They say things like, don't treat me like a kid, and can you wash this shirt for me, Mum? I don't know how to drive the trouser-go-roundy machine. <laughs> They smoke fags behind bicycle sheds, thereby setting up a subconscious connection in later life between cycling and bronchitis. <laughs> and they spend their lives coming out of pub toilets wondering how a piece of green rubber with knobbly bits on can possibly be a safe and reliable contraceptive approved by the World Health Organization, <laughs> when its main medical claim to fame is that it tastes of banana ice cream. <laughs> Some young people want to be old adults. These are young fogies. Youngsters who wear tweed jackets with leather patches and smoke pipes and talk like a walrus with another walrus inside its mouth. <laughs> they do this to appear grown up and because they cannot get any sex with women. <laughs> but no one is fooled as they sit down to read their daily telegraphs because the headline on their daily telegraph is Behind this newspaper sits the world's loneliest man. <laughs> but in the end, we get old. We watch TV programmes where mad people point at flowers and cream their trousers over lawn maintenance. <laughs> we find the music of the electric light orchestra strangely seductive. But we still don't want to be old, so we dress young. In the old days, the moment you hit 25, your youth clothes were stolen by the Adidas fairy and replaced with three baggy demob suits and a flat cap. Nowadays, you see people whose bus passes would fetch millions at Sotheby's going round dressed up like Daddy Puff Daddy. Actually, when people dress young, they always dress out-of-date young, so they think they look cool and modern, when in fact they look like one of the audience for an old Top of the Pops with Shack Attack on UK Gold. <laughs> now, my theory is that when people go to the bingo looking like Adam and the Ants gone mouldy, they're not pretending to be 19, they're pretending it's still 1980, in which case they would still be 19. And all the train drivers really would be six years old. <laughs> Tonight on Carlton, an evening of quality faced drama. At seven, there's city drama with chance air, followed by psychodrama with crack air. At eight, there's wrong channel drama with spend air. At nine, there's manly drama with bloke air. And at ten, a new series The Cartoon Adventures of the Young Marquis de Sade. <laughs> The Cartoon Adventures of the Young Marquis de Sade. No! France, 1792. All Paris is under the heel of Le Terror. Madame Guillotine is going down on the bloated necks of Johnny Aristocrat again and again. But 500 miles away in the infamous Chateau des Arbres Noirs, the notorious Black Forest Chateau, young 17-year-old Gilles Dufont, Dupont Dufont, has a dream. When I grow up, Jacques, I'm going to be a pervert. Oh, oh, oh. Is that right, little one? Well, first, you can give me a hand with these logs. Oh, all right. Can I dress as a woman later? Just carry the logs, Gilles. Whoa, whoa, you Bloody woe, you horse kid! Runaway horse! Look out, Jill! I'll save you, monsieur! <laughs> what twat shot my horse? <laughs> I did! Are you gonna whip me? You'll pay for this impertinence. Oh. I, uh, I apologize for the boy, sir. He was only trying to help. You, get us a new horse. Yes, sir! And you, boy, you're coming with me. To where, sir? To Madame Num Num's brothel of filth. <laughs> Can you play the piano? If I fail, will you beat me? Oh, good grief. <laughs> Goodbye, Jacques. One day I will return, but not before the whole world knows the name of Gilles Dufont Dupont Dufont Dufont, the young Marquis du Sade. <laughs> wow.
What's that? It's a picture of me and my mum. Wow. You look like sisters. I'll tell her that. She'll be really pleased. Why? Oh, I see. <laughs> Doctor, I think there's something wrong with Mr Jenkins. I'm not surprised, you silly woman. I said roast his nuts on a brazier, not a brazier. Now get dressed and take this goose with you. <laughs> For several years now, I've been planning my funeral. It's very important to me that it's just a small group of friends since I want the people I hate to find out how much I really hated them by asking them not to attend. <laughs> They'd have to watch the funeral from a nearby hill like a murder suspect on the run in the Sweeney. <laughs> Unless, of course, they weren't going to come in the first place since they hadn't seen me in years and frankly couldn't remember who I was. <laughs> Planning the actual funeral is a problem. I might choose a green funeral with a cardboard coffin, although green funerals are not for everyone, at least not for those that met a violent death. <laughs> In these tragic circumstances, Friends of the Earth sell a funeral pipe that runs from the hearse to the grave. That's a lie, of course. We all know that the only truly green funeral is to rub yourself with cat food and lie down in an alley. <laughs> then there's cremation. It's better than burial. It's cleaner. It's more final. You don't fester. You slide behind the curtain and you're gone. Really? Work it out. The human body takes four hours to burn. Crematoriums do someone every half hour. <laughs> There's no fire behind that curtain. Next time you go to a cremation, write your initials on the coffin in tiny letters. It'll come round again like a marked fiver. <laughs> then there's funeral parlours. Funeral parlours, what a stupid name. That's as stupid as corpse pantry or shot with decaying body in the back room or really ineffectual hospital. <laughs> I don't want a funeral parlour, I want something trendy. For example, having established Virgin Brides, the marriage service, Virgin are setting up Virgin Deaths, a complete expiry service. From economy, where Richard Branson comes around and shoots you, to business class, where you get to fly the plane. <laughs> Despite all the evidence pointing towards death, people don't seem to enjoy it. This is a shame, as dying is your last chance to torment the living. I'm going to stipulate that my body be laid out for slightly too long. <laughs> And always keep your family in mind. Likewise, if you've got a terminal illness, you might want to keep a diary to comfort your relatives after you're gone. <laughs> Thursday, making plans. I'm feeling much... <laughs> yeah. Tonight on Anglia TV, the little silver nightman on the horse meet a nice lady. <laughs> but first... The all-new Cartoon Adventures of the Young Marquis de Sade. And then, Monsieur le Bishop, then I stole some apples. Oh. <laughs> and I was sick in the cardinal's mouth. Oh. And then, Monsieur le Bishop, then I thought bad thoughts about the Mother Superior. Oh. Then I rubbed a boiled egg up and down in my armpit and it made me feel funny. Ooh. <laughs> Why have you stopped, Monsieur Le Bishop? My bloody arm's gone dead. <laughs> oh, God! Creep up on me, sir. Look at my old man from below. No! <laughs> Rub me low down. Only a shilling. Push me into a woman's back. Get off me! Get out! Trip me up, sir. Trip me up and land on me hard. Make my hips hurt. <laughs> no! <laughs> We have reached the South Pole. And for what? Amundsen has beaten us. <laughs> Hello? Carol? Yeah, I'm at the South Pole. <laughs> well, I'm going to be a bit late. We still have the huskies and food for one day. We can get back to base camp. Hello? Carol? I'm breaking up. Listen, guys, I'm just borrowing the sledge. I need to go into town and buy a battery charger. What? What are you doing? I'm going out. I may be gone for some time. <laughs> I'll tell you what I don't like. The aristocracy. Never mind that their idea of a fit actress bird is Helena Bonham Carter. Never mind that the official guide to toffs, the chinless Norman bastard's yellow pages, is called Burke's Peerage. That gives the game away. Toffs are just weird. 
They have no chins, they have six names, and they can make love for a week without stopping. No, they can't. But they do have their own costumes, like superheroes. If you're a lord, you get a hat and a bloody big cape made of ermine, which is like stoat, only fantastic. <laughs> even though they're all loaded already, toffs make even more money by opening their houses to the public, and even though we get our houses from estate agents and toffs get them from genocide, we all go around them going, wow, great, thank you. If a toff marries a royal, we go, oh, a fairy tale romance, even though they haven't got two chins to rub together. And we all go and stand in the street and wave Union Jacks to remind them where they live. <laughs> Worst of all, we want to be toffs. We buy titles for thousands of pounds. We get knighted so strangers can call us by our Christian names, and if they get it wrong, we can say, Sir Bum Candle, actually, in a stupid stern voice. <laughs> Listen, if having a title is so good, how come Cliff Richards got one? Is Geoffrey Archer a lord because he's good at fighting in tournaments? I mean, imagine Camelot now, King Arthur going, Now, my goodly knights, we must away to fight foul Mordred. Come, brave Sir Elton John. Come, Sir Cliff. I'm to horse, Sir Paul Daniels, and your wife, Lady the lovely Debbie McGee. You know how old people have to keep taking their driving test? Toff should have to fight to keep their titles. That's fair. Give Andrew Lloyd Bloody Webber a pony and tell him you can have Birmingham if you take it by force. Or, alternatively, tie him to the back of a pig and whip him naked through the streets of London. And then see if he wants to write My Name is Rumpelteas of the Cat. <laughs> he's here. He's there. He's mostly made of air. It's the pumpable peer, Lord Bouncy. <laughs> Mistaken for Prince Rondo of Ruritania, Lord Bouncy is challenged to a duel. One, two, on guard. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about all we have time for. It certainly is. Put your hand on me bum, sir. Oh, not again. Miss, give me a Chinese burn on my thigh. No, get off! Only a farthing, sir! Fourpence, fourpence to hold me kipper! Fourpence ain't really farthing, rub me up! No! <laughs> Why not? Because we're off. We are. Goodbye. Grip me, hard as you like, on me mound of Venus! <laughs> That's all from Busman and Quantic, King Size. Thank you all for coming. I'm Jane Busman. I'm David Quantic. They're the cast. Peter. And now the evening ends. The end of day draws near. An end to all the torments in the living years. Busman and Quantic King Size was written by and starred Jane Busman and David Quantic with Lord Peter Serafinowicz, the High Prince Steve Brody, and Dame Emma Clark. The producer is Phil Bowker. Oh, go on, give me one. No. no. <laughs>